It's Thanksgiving time here in the US, which means everyone is talking about turkeys. Which is why we here at SciShow are not going to. Instead, today's compilation features a bunch of other incredible birds, from weird ones that smell like fruit to the kind of terrifying ones. Because once you start looking, you'll find that there are a lot of amazing species out there. But first up, one pretty much all of us think we know well. The humble pigeon. Though it turns out pigeons are a lot more interesting than you probably give them credit for. Here's a very young Hank to explain. We all know the white dove is a symbol of peace and purity. So, what do pigeons symbolize? Dirt and disease? Well, problem here, pigeons and doves, same thing. Just turns out, one is a slightly better dresser. Doves and pigeons are both members of the same family, Columbidae, whose 308 species can be found pretty much any place on Earth except Antarctica, and they come in a variety of sizes and colors. Since the dodo disappeared, yes, dodos were pigeons, the turkey-sized crowned pigeon is the biggest of the family, while the sparrow-sized New World ground dove is the smallest. Now, you have most definitely seen some kind of pigeon in your life, but did you know pigeons produce milk. They don't lactate like mammals, but they do produce a similar milk-like substance to feed their chicks. Now, if this sounds bizarre, it's because it is. All pigeons do it, but they're joined only by flamingos and male emperor penguins in this ability. Crop milk is a fat and protein-rich substance produced by both male and female pigeon parents. The milky white stuff is churned up in the bird's crop or throat pouch, usually used for food storage. The crop changes in response to hormones when eggs hatch, and like a mammary gland, enters a sort of lactation period. Pigeon milk contains tons of antioxidants and plays a key role in boosting a chick's immune system much like mammalian breast milk does. Also, pigeons bob their heads to see better. Lots of birds bob their heads as they strut around looking like Mick Jagger, and pigeons are no exception. The head bobbing probably helps the birds stay balanced on their legs, which spring out fairly far back behind their bodies, but researchers think this kind of jiving has more to do with stabilizing their vision. We humans can stabilize our vision with our eyeballs. They stay in the same place when I move my head around. And unless we're really feeling the Dr. Dre, we don't need to bob our heads while we walk. But Pigeons have a harder time multitasking in a busy world. It's easier to observe a moving object when your head is still, so when a pigeon bobs its head, it's actually holding its head in place temporarily while its body moves and then thrusts its head forward again. This keeps the head stable for as long as possible, so the pigeon can keep an eye out for squirmy insects or swooping hawks. We know this because in the late 1970s, creative ornithologist Barry Frost put some pigeons on a treadmill to see what happened. And in the controlled surroundings of the lab, with no bugs or birds or prey to watch out for, the birds' heads didn't bob. Third thing, pigeons are decorated war heroes with excellent hearing. People have been using homing pigeons to deliver messages for centuries. Persian kings used them, Julius Caesar used them, and in World War I, soldiers on the front used them to relay hundreds of thousands of messages. One famous flyer named Cher Ami single-wingedly saved a battalion of 600 trapped French soldiers flying home with a missing eye, a bullet in its breast, and a leg dangling by a thread. Cher eventually healed and was awarded with the prestigious service cross. When he finally died years later, he was stuffed and mounted, and now resides at the Smithsonian Institution. Humans have never quite understood homing pigeons' ability to find their way home across large distances, but a recent theory may have solved the mystery. USGS researcher Jonathan Hagstrom believes that the birds use low-frequency sound waves to create a sort of acoustic map by which to navigate home. Pigeons can hear down to the faintest of infrasound noises, down to even about 0.1 hertz, whereas even under the best laboratory conditions, humans can't hope to hear under 12 hertz. Hagstrom got the idea that the birds used sound frequencies when he noticed racing pigeons going astray whenever the supersonic Concorde jet was flying nearby. The jet's sonic interference was disorienting the pigeons. Weather, landscape, and atmospheric changes can also lead the birds astray. So yeah, pigeons! Turns out they're pretty rad, so be nice. Looks like I need to give pigeons a bit more credit. Though, if we're gonna give them credit for awesome hearing, this next bird should get some kind of medal or something. Because it uses its stellar hearing to see. Hank, tell everyone about the incredible oil bird. In the tropical rainforests of South America, there's a flying animal that lives in colonies, in caves, emerges at night in search for food, and navigates using echolocation. And I'm not 
talking about a bat. Believe it or not, I'm actually talking about a bird, the bizarre oil bird known to locals as the guachero. Oil birds diverged from their closest living relatives 50 million years ago, and in a lot of ways, they've become more like bats than other birds. They roost high up in caves, for example. One oil bird colony can include as many as 20,000 crow-sized birds. And since there's not a lot of nesting material available in a cave, they build their funnel-shaped nests out of a mixture of regurgitated fruit and their own feces. Sounds cozy. Yeah? And like a lot of nocturnal animals, including many bats for the record, they have excellent night vision. They accomplish that by packing their retinas with rods. The light receptor is responsible for vision in dim lighting. In fact, oil bird retinas have the highest density of rods of any known vertebrate, one million of them per square millimeter. Your retina has a max of about 150,000 rods per square millimeter. These birds have so many rods that there's almost no room left over for cones. The other light receptors, which handle visual acuity and color. That means that their view of the world is probably fuzzy and dull. Even the world record holder for rod density needs some light to see, though, so that birds' eyes are no help in pitch black caverns, which might be why they're the only birds that have figured out how to echolocate. To keep from getting confused in a densely populated cave, each bird clicks at a slightly different frequency. And unlike bats, oil birds' clicks are audible to human ears, so if you were standing in one of these caves when the birds return to rest, you'd hear quite the cacophony. Oil birds' resemblance to bats is a classic example of convergent evolution, where different animals facing similar pressures from natural selection end up with similar traits. They're so bat-like that you would think we'd called them bat birds, but if you're wondering where that name came from, yes, there's a story there. Oil bird comes from the fact that their favorite food is the fatty fruit of the oil palm. Baby oil birds in particular become so plump from their palm-rich diet that indigenous people in Venezuela used to collect chicken so they could render their fat in pots to use as fuel. You know, the more I think about it, the more I like bat birds instead. Maybe it's time for, like, a rebranding. While we're on the subject of birds that have mastered darkness, let's talk about owls. Owls have evolved some pretty impressive adaptations to rule the night. And here's, oh look, it's Hank, again, with the details. As animals go, owls are pretty awesome. I mean, just look at Hedwig. There are about 200 owl species on Earth, and you'll find them on every continent except Antarctica. They can be as small as the sparrow-sized elf owl, or as huge as the eagle-sized great gray. And most are nocturnal loners with broad heads, an upright stance, big front-facing eyes, and gnarly talons. Many cultures associate owls with either wisdom or death. And though they aren't quite as bright as some other birds, like crows or ravens, the death thing might not be so far off. Because if there's one thing owls are really good at, it is killing things. Quietly. You might even say that they're the ninjas of the bird world, equipped with some unique adaptations that make them experts at both hunting and getting their creep on. Let's start with their feathers. For example, maybe you've been out walking at some point and you heard some whooshing sound, only to look up and see a bird flying overhead. Well, odds are that was not an owl making that noise. Most birds have smooth, sleek primary feathers, which create a noisy kind of turbulence as their wings collide with the air. And that's fine if you're a plant-eating goose or, say, a falcon who's so fast it doesn't matter if your prey hears you coming because they're already toast. But to a night-hunting owl, catching dinner is all about stealth. So their feathers are specially adapted to reduce that air turbulence and the noise that comes with it. Instead of a smooth, stiff leading edge, an owl's primary feathers look more like combs. Those serrated edges actually break up the air as it hits the wings, creating a bunch of smaller, less noisy disturbances in the air. And even those get muffled by a softer fringe at the trailing edge of the wing. But owls also come equipped with an extra silencer. Their smaller down feathers, which absorb whatever noise is left over. Magic feathers are awesome and all, but probably the first thing you'll notice about an owl are their ridiculously huge front-facing eyes, which can weigh up to 5% of their body weight. All the better to see you with. Because most owls are nocturnal, their eyes need to be good at processing whatever light is available. So owl eyes have large corneas and pupils that allow extra light to enter the eye and funnel back into the image-forming retina. And compared to many other birds, owl retinas contain more of the light-sensitive rods that help them see in low-light conditions. 
direction. Slash the front facing setup lets owls look forward with both eyes, giving them a wider range of binocular vision than most birds. It also helps them judge distance and dimensions, kind of like how humans do it. But it is not easy to squeeze such big eyes into a comparatively small skull, so owl eyes aren't round like a typical eyeball. Instead, they're more elongated and tube-shaped. They're also fixed into their sockets by rings of bone called sclerotic rings, which means owls can't roll their eyes, and if they want to look to the side, they have to turn their whole head. That said, contrary to popular belief, no owl can go full Linda Blair and rotate their head all the way around, though they can rotate them three quarters of the way in either direction, which is still pretty impressive. I mean, imagine looking to your right by turning your head all the way to your left. It's hard to picture for a good reason, because if you tried it, you would either cut off the flow of blood to your brain and have a stroke, tear an artery, or simply snap your neck. And in any of those cases, you would be dead. So, you know, don't try it. But how come owls can do that? Well, for starters, they have more vertebrae in their necks, 14 compared to our seven. And their heads are connected to their necks by just one pivot joint as opposed to our two. This single joint gives the bird's head much more flexibility, allowing it to pivot its head on the vertebrae column, sort of like how you can pivot your body on one foot. Those neck bones also feature extra large holes, about 10 times larger than the artery that passes through them, and probably hold air sacs that help cushion that fragile artery while the owl twists its neck so it doesn't tear. But in 2012, a research team from Johns Hopkins discovered that there's more to the owl neck rotation puzzle. They found that while most animals' arteries typically get smaller the farther they are from the heart, an owl's main neck artery actually gets a little bigger as it nears the brain, ballooning out. Those larger areas might act as reservoirs, storing a little extra blood to send to the brain when the main vessel gets temporarily blocked during more extreme neck rotations. So. Here's to Hedwig and all her other fellow owls, master ninja birds of the night. As cool as night ninjas are, the birds in our next episode have mastered an impressive hunting trick we once thought was unique to our species. They use fire to capture their prey. Seriously. And here's Stefan to tell us about nature's arsonists, the firehawks. It's no secret that birds can be pretty smart. You've probably heard of birds using tools or solving puzzles, but in Australia, they take things to the next level. There, some birds are said to intentionally start fires, making them the only animals besides humans known to do that. Most animals don't like being near fire. The standard instinct around flames is to drop what you're doing and run. But some birds of prey do just the opposite. If they spot a wildfire, they'll actually fly towards it. They've figured out that fire causes little critters to panic and flee, making them easy targets. As long as the birds are careful not to get burned, a fire can mean an easy meal. This incredible behavior is called fire foraging, and it's been seen in predatory birds around the world. But in Australian tropical savannas, some birds seem to take this strategy a step further. They're known as firehawks because they're said to fly into active fires, carry away a burning stick in their beak or talons, and then drop it into dry brush to start a totally new fire. There's a lot we don't know about this avian arson. It's never been reliably captured on photo or video, but the stories trace back generations. Around the world, there are human cultures that have lived alongside native wildlife for hundreds or thousands of years, and these cultures can be a valuable source of what's called indigenous ecological knowledge. And a 2017 study set out to collect this local knowledge. Most stories identify three species as the arsonists, black kites, whistling kites, and brown falcons, though there may be other birds that do it too. And the team found that at least 12 different ethnic aboriginal groups reported first-hand knowledge of fire spreading in these birds. Birds. They're even in some of their religious ceremonies. One account goes as far as to suggest that early Aboriginal people may have learned the trick of fire foraging by watching the birds. The study also collected observations from non-Aboriginal people, including modern-day firefighters. As you can imagine, birds that can start fires could be a real pain if your job is to control blazes, so local firefighters are often on the lookout for the birds. One firefighter reported an instance where he spent an afternoon putting out seven different fires started by kites. And another witnessed a group of birds start a fire that burned so out of control that it damaged a local cattle station. In total, the study found accounts of fire spreading from West Australia, Queensland, and the Northern Territory, a total area of thousands of square kilometers. So it may not be video footage, but it's pretty comprehensive ethno-ornithological evidence, that is, cultural knowledge of birds. But the behavior still hasn't been scientifically observed and documented, so the researchers aren't done yet. They plan to conduct more interviews, set up field experiments, and equip local rangers with the tools to catch the birds in the act. And all that will hopefully reveal how often the birds birds start fires, and how firefighters can best plan around the behavior. And it may even help researchers figure out how they learned to do it in the first place. 
Firehawk will forever be the most hardcore name ever given to a bird. It's just so metal. Even though they're kind of sweet compared to the birds in the next episode, gulls. Yes, those big things that like to steal food from your beach picnics. If you thought they were just annoying, well, Hank has some news for you. When you're out enjoying, like, a nice picnic on the beach, you might occasionally find a gull trying to grab some of your chips, and you're like, get, oh, just stop bothering us, you know. Well, just imagine for a moment that instead of your picnic basket, those gulls were after your, your flesh. Because one particular species of gull has recently developed a taste for live mammal meat, revealing just how adaptable these animals are. Most gulls eat fish or invertebrates like crabs, though they'll occasionally snack on carcasses if they wash up. They're considered generalist, opportunistic feeders. They'll pretty much take whatever they can get. But in the past 50 years or so, one species, the kelp gull has developed a fondness for mammalian flesh and learned just how to get it. It all started in Peninsula Valdez, Argentina, a birthing ground for southern right whales. Giving birth is exhausting for everyone involved, so both new mamas and their babies like to relax and rest near the ocean's surface. And that's precisely when the gulls attack. These half a meter long, roughly one kilogram birds land on the whale's backs and peel off pieces of skin until until the wound becomes big enough that they can dig into the blubber underneath. Gross and mean! They mostly attack calves because the babies haven't learned how to arch their back or flick the gulls off like their moms have. But what's really terrifying is that the gulls' hunger for flesh is growing stronger. Between 2003 and 2014, more than 50 calves died per year on average in Valdez, compared to only eight per year in the decade before. People aren't 100% certain that all those deaths were caused by gulls, but scientists have noted an increase in the number and severity of attacks. The percentage of whales with gull-inflicted wounds rose from 2% in the 1970s to a gruesome 99% in the 2000s, according to a 2015 Plus One study. And the situation is now so bad that the gulls are considered a significant threat to right whale populations in the area. These guys got too smart. So since 2012, local governments have been culling some of the murder birds to try and protect the whales. But it's not just Argentina whales that have to keep an eye on the skies. Kelp gulls in Namibia have recently discovered a taste for baby fur seal eyeballs. Like something out of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, the gulls will repeatedly swoop down and peck at the eyeballs of unattended Cape fur seal pups until the pups go blind. Once they're unable to see, more gulls join in the feast and peck at the juicy... Wait, I'm just gonna stop. I'm gonna read what the script even says. It's too sad. Let's just say the pups don't make it. And since we've only known that gulls are preying on seal pups since 2014, no one knows yet if seal numbers will be affected. These chilling behaviors likely developed in part because gulls have such a generalist diet, but also because they're quite good at observational learning, meaning they can learn new behaviors just from watching other gulls. So just a few likely discovered that squishy eyeballs and hunks of blubber are great sources of protein, fat, and fluid, and other quickly caught on to the new snacks. Which explains why the behaviors are pretty much only seen in the same areas they began, though they could spread. And we might also be to blame for the increase in the gull's murderous behavior. Because of our activities, their usual prey is harder to come by. But this hasn't hurt their numbers, as these flexible birds have learned that our refuse is full of potential food. So unlike many species, they do well in the places we've figuratively and literally trashed. I guess we should count ourselves lucky that they haven't figured out what human eyeballs taste like yet. Just have a, have a chip. Have a chip. It's fine. You can have my chips. Oh my god. Well, looks like I'm never going to the beach again. I need a bit of a palate cleanser after that horror show, so how about some pretty fragrant seabirds? The definitely not gulls in the next episode have a delightful scent to them. But enough from me. I'll let Hank explain what's going on. On the remote rocky islands of the North Pacific, you might find a happy-looking little bird. Called the crested auklet, it looks kind of like a cross between a penguin and a quail. They live in big, dense, noisy colonies, and they go out to the ocean to feed. They also, apparently, smell like tangerines. The smell, which has been described as distinctive and pungent, emerges at the beginning of the breeding season. As for what's actually causing it, the smell seems to come from a mix of compounds secreted by a patch of special 
special hair-like, possibly hollow feathers called wick feathers found on a particular area of skin on their back. It just got a little tangerine patch back there. The mix of compounds is dominated by aldehydes, a kind of chemical that contains a carbon bonded to a hydrogen and double bonded to an oxygen. As for why, there are two hypotheses. One is that the smelly aldehydes might be a way for the birds to repel parasites like lice, kind of like a built-in can of bug spray. Experiments have shown that some of the compounds in the smell can repel or paralyze ticks or lice. The other idea is that it might be some kind of sexual display or some other sort of social signal. During courtship, crested auklets approach potential mates and bury their bill in that patch in what's known as a rough sniff. And they can definitely smell it. Studies have shown that the birds can tell the scent apart from other smells, and even appeared to be attracted to it when presented with a smelly, fake bird. Which is kind of neat, because for a long time, many experts thought birds couldn't really smell things. That idea was debunked by scientists in the 1960s, and that research doesn't have much of anything to do with crested auklets. But as a myth, it's had surprising staying power. It might seem kind of funny, but choosing the smelliest mate might have some benefits. If the scent is a parasite repellent, for example, a smelly mate is less likely to pass infestations to their mate or their offspring. The smell might also be an indicator of how healthy the animal is in general. Its body has to produce those smelly chemicals, which requires energy, and because all smells eventually fade over time, an animal that depends on cologne to win a mate has to keep making new compounds all the time. Which means it has the energy to burn to make smelly molecules, even though those resources could be used for other, more survival-oriented things. This means for crested auklets, a strong scent might be a way to show that you're not only healthy, but you have the resources to burn. And finally, let's talk about birds that can talk like us. Parrot's ability to speak is really impressive. And Olivia is here to explain how they manage to do this thing that even our closest relatives can't do. Parrots have an uncanny ability to mimic human speech. Their mad vocal skills have let them co-host TED Talks, sing in heavy metal bands, and made them the pet of choice to deliver punchlines in pirate movies. Part of this is just being able to make the sounds that we do. Parrots have articulate tongues, which can move around in their mouths and shift frequencies to make human-like vowel sounds. But mostly, parrots have unique brains. When the majority of birds chirp or sing, they're making noises that are hardwired. But parrots can create new vocalizations, which scientists call vocal learning. Not only that, but something about their neurons make them incredibly good at vocal mimicry replicating the sounds or calls of other species. Only three types of birds are capable of vocal learning. Hummingbirds, songbirds, and parrots. Scientists don't know exactly how vocal learning helps them, but freestyling might let different groups of birds tell each other apart, which could help them identify enemies and form strong social bonds. Despite being very different birds, hummingbirds, songbirds, and parrots all have seven clusters of neurons in their brain called song nuclei. Since other birds don't have these brain regions, scientists think they've got to be behind vocal learning. The song nuclei are surrounded by or next to parts of the brain that control movement. The ones involved in learning are towards the front of the brain, and those involved in sound production are farther back. But just having song nuclei doesn't explain why parrots are so so much better at, well, parroting speech. Now, most research on mimicry in parrots uses the common parakeet, or budgie, as a model for the whole group. But in 2015, researchers took a look at the brains of a bunch of different parrots and found that they all had something that hummingbirds and songbirds didn't an extra layer, or shell, surrounding each nucleus. It's a bit like the candy coating on a Skittle. Parrots had the full candy, while other birds just have the fruity core. And differences in the amount of shell seem to correlate to mimicking abilities. Expert imitators like the African gray parrot have much larger shell regions and smaller cores than copycats who are less skilled like budgies and peach-faced lovebirds. So far, it's just a correlation, so these shells may not be the reason, or the only reason, why parrots are super mimics. Not to mention, scientists don't know how the shells function right now, although they know that the shells link to each other and make different connections than the cores. Based on similarities in the types of genes expressed in each brain region, scientists think that this double-layered song system may have come about because song nuclei got duplicated more than 29 million years ago. We humans didn't gain our refined linguistic abilities until millions of years later. So when it really comes down to it, who's mimicking whom? Thanks for learning about these amazing birds with me. We'd love to hear about which was your favorite and why in the comments section. Also, since it's the last week of November, I want to remind you that it's the last week to get this month's SciShow pin. Every month we have a new design, and this month it's Mariner 9. 
That rhymed. Anyhow, come December 1st, we'll have a whole new pin for you. So if you want this one, either for yourself or a space fan in your life, you'd better get yours soon. Just head over to DFTBA.com and search for the SciShow Pin of the Month or peruse that merch bar below. 